All right, you're welcome. It is COVID-19 360, and we're taking it straight from the press briefing. Today we have the Minister for Trade and Industry, Honorable Alan Chairman Ting, um, speaking to us about the protocols that should be adhered to in the various institutions, uh, talking about uh, institutions with more than 29 staff, especially these factories, having a holding room for anyone who might exhibit symptoms that may indicate that they might have contracted the virus. And also, we should have someone who sanitizes the environment as often as possible. And again, for institutions that have more than 29 staff members, there should be a registered nurse on standby, um, you know, to care for anyone who may exhibit symptoms that could prove that they actually have COVID-19. There are a number of issues that were raised and a few protocols that were laid out by the minister. Uh, if time will allow us, we'll go through that. We also got an update of our case count. And so um, we'll be giving you all that information on COVID-19 360. We're on till 11.30 a.m. My name is Berla Mundi. And my name is Anita Ikea Kufu. So last, uh, or yesterday around 5.30 p.m., there was an update of 445 new cases being recorded and also recoveries at 11,078 with confirmed cases at 15,013. But as at the last update this morning, 460 new cases have been recorded from 34 districts, and that is nine regions. And also recoveries now stands at 11,433. That is 355 new recoveries from the last update yesterday. And so when we put all the cases that we've recorded so far together, we have 905 new cases just this week. So from the last update on uh, Monday, as at yesterday evening, and also today, uh, this morning, 905 new cases. We have six critically ill, uh, 95 deaths, and the deaths have been at 95 from yesterday as well. And uh, for the new cases that were recorded, 64%, that is 293 of it, just from the greater Accra region with 36 from the remaining eight regions. And so we'll be giving you a better breakdown of the case count from the Ghana Health Service website, but I think they're yet to update their site on the new figure. That is a 460 new uh, cases that have been recorded, but we will be giving you the breakdown right here on COVID-19 360. You can get interactive with us on our social media pages and also our WhatsApp number is active as well. And if you're outside Ghana, Prefix the number with plus two, three, three. Bella? Absolutely. I think we should just go ahead and break down the numbers for them. Like you mentioned, um, uh, Mr. Ken, uh, Patrick Kumabwaja, pardon me, updated us on the figures. And so I believe Anita will take us through that. All right, sure. So uh, from what I was able to capture, the 15,472 new cases were from the nine regions with 9,146 from the enhanced contact tracing and then 6,327 from the general surveillance. And for recoveries, we now have 11,433. That is 355 new recoveries. 22 of the cases we've recorded so far are severe. Six are critically ill. We have 95 deaths and active cases at 3,947. Now, uh, the Greater Accra region recorded 293 cases. That is the highest, which is 64%. The Western region with 44. The Ashanti region with 42. OT 3, Northern 18, Western North 2, and then the Bono East with 12. And also, some details were given on the production of face masks by um, uh, Mr. Kojo Alan Chermating, and he made mention of the fact that they are expecting to produce some 6.2 million uh, face masks by the end of July 2020. And the target by the end is 14.6 million. And so on a daily basis, they are looking at producing some 6.2 million. And for hospital gowns, they are looking at 90,000 hospital gowns. Head covers 90,000. Medical scraps also 60,000. And so the local production is still ongoing. But the question is, some 300,000 that some months back we were told were being produced on a large scale. What has happened to the mass goods? We haven't been given a lot of updates regarding the production of, uh, you know, those masks as well. But if this is the target we're looking at, which is uh, 6.2 million by the end of July, that is barely uh, some few days away. And so we're looking forward to that as well. But in totality, this is the summary of 
the press briefing that just uh, went by at the Ministry of Information. And these are some of the breakdowns. And so we're taking a break at this point. When we come back, it is still COVID-19, 360. We'll be giving you the cases on the African continent and also on the global scale as well. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360. We'll be speaking to our experts shortly and later we'll cross over to the central region to speak to one of our correspondents to update us on the current situation in that region, uh, knowing very well that it has become the fourth point um, of transmission in terms of the numbers that we have recorded in the various regions. And so central region is gradually also becoming a hot spot. And so what are the measures that have been put in place in the region to ensure that we keep the spread uh, of the virus, especially knowing that a lot of these women are also engaged in some informal um, work with some of them also being in the markets as well, which is another means of transmitting the virus. So we'll have a conversation later, but let's find out what Africa's case count is with Anita. All right. So as of this morning, we've confirmed 336,932 coronavirus cases in Africa. And out of that figure, 6,122 our uh, healthcare workers and for those who have passed on unfortunately we have 8858 with 160,897 uh, you know coronavirus cases being confirmed as recovered and so South Africa as always is leading with 111,000 796 and all over the world one of the hardest hit sectors is the tourism and hospitality sector but for south africa they are losing some 270 billion rand when it comes to the tourism and hospitality sector and that has become uh, a, a big worry when it comes to south africa because they rack in a lot of revenue when it comes to tourism as every single week every single time they have people coming in for recreational purposes and so that is a huge loss for South Africa. Now, when we go to Egypt, they have 59,561 confirmed cases. And due to the high number of cases that are being recorded in Egypt, there has been a surge in uh, purchasing of drugs and uh, medicine just, you know, to take in and also to be able to keep the uh, spread of the virus. And that is an individual preference as a parliamentary member in Egypt mentioned that that should be restricted and people shouldn't be allowed to just uh, be walking into pharmacies to be buying drugs that they've seen on social media and they have been recommended to by other people just because they want to uh, be protective of themselves and their families. And so that is one thing that that parliamentary member is uh, raising concern over. And when we go to Nigeria, the most populous nation in Africa, they have tested 120,108 people. And looking at the population of Nigeria, that is really low. As even Ghana, with uh, a little over 30 million, we have uh, tested over 270,000 uh, people so far. And so for Nigeria, that is a huge concern there as well. And as of this morning, their figure is 22,020 confirmed cases. And down here in Ghana, we've added some 460 new cases. And that has increased our figure. And we are all, more over the 15,000 mark. And as at this morning, we've recorded some 15,000 or 15,000 cases. Cameroon with 12,592. And this morning, let's also take a look at countries that are recording below the 100 uh number of cases namibia with 90 botswana with 89 gambia has 42 cases and lesotho uh, one of my favorites barely a month ago they made their debut and they, lesotho was the last country to record a case on the african continent and as of this morning they have 17 cases with seychelles recording the least on the african continent with 14 cases now let's take a look at the recoveries and how the various countries are doing south africa is leading with 56,874 recoveries, Egypt with 15,935, Ghana with 11,078, Cameroon with 10,100. And so these four countries have recorded over 10,000 recoveries. And Algeria comes in fifth with 8,792, 
and then Morocco with 8,400 and 88 for the deaths as always egypt is leading when it comes to this parameter and egypt has 2450 south africa second with 2205 and then algeria with 869 sudan with 548 uh, nigeria is fifth with 542 deaths and this is the only parameter that ghana comes in down there somewhere and uh, with 95 cases and even Kenya has recorded more deaths Morocco more deaths with 216 DRC also has more deaths when it comes to that parameter as well and so let's move over to the Johns Hopkins website and find out how on the global scale we are doing and so as of this morning 9,440,535 coronavirus cases have been recorded across 188 countries globally with death standing at 482,923, and then recoveries at 4,754,755. And um, the United States is leading with 2,381,369. And so that is it for the United States. And Brazil has 1 million. 188,631. And when you go to Brazil, they have been touted as having the most embarrassing way of handling the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, especially when there's a surge in cases every single day in Brazil. And having a president who, uh, you know, doesn't really believe in the existence of the virus, of course, how can they even handle it any better? Now let's go to Russia. And Russia uh, yesterday had... Um, you know, their parade, the military parade uh, after 70 years of the Nazi Germany war. And there has been some concerns over the way the parade was handled. They had the military men and soldiers parading without masks. And then and that has been a big concern as well because the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, uh, before you go see him, he has a tunnel in which you have to be disinfected through the tunnel before you even go to see him. And so for him allowing the parade to go on, and allowing soldiers to march without any mask on, that has been some talk in Russia. But let's go to India, where a lot of females uh, uh, from aspects, you know, have, have been, uh, you know, explaining that when it comes to women who are being infected by COVID-19 in India, they stand a higher risk of passing on when they are infected by the virus. But uh, for India, they have 473,105 cases and the United Kingdom with 308,337. And in the UK, they are also easing restrictions, especially when it comes to public places like restaurants, hotels, but with limited number of people. But let's go to the recoveries now. And this morning, uh, wow, Brazil is... is surprisingly doing well when it comes to the recoveries now they have gone past uh, the united states and so globally brazil is leading with 660,469 recoveries making them number one and for the first time brazil has been able to uh, you know remain that uh, you know get that number one spot with the united states becoming the second and this is according to the johns hopkins coronavirus resource center dashboard and so the united states now has 656,161 recoveries and then russia still maintaining the third position with 374,557 and so brazil is not doing so bad at, uh, you know after all but for the deaths the u.s is leading with 121,000 979 deaths and then brazil is second and so it's either brazil is first us is second or us is first and then brazil is second so for the deaths they have 53,830 deaths the united kingdom is third with 43,165 and so that is it for the johns hopkins coronavirus resource center dashboard and still the projection at 10 million where Definitely looking forward to crossing that 10 million. Hmm. Yeah, I was hoping that we won't get there, but uh, I guess we can't do much anyway. Um, so we're going to cross over and get some updates from Delan, what's happening across the world before we speak to Dr. Bertha Sewai. Welcome to News Update on COVID-19 360. France's iconic Eiffel Tower has opened again to guests after its longest closure since World War II. 
But the Paris Monumentum isn't returning to normal operations just yet. Visitors' numbers will be limited, face coverings mandatory for everyone aged over 11, and everywhere above the second floor will be closed to the public. To soak in the sights of the capital, guests will also have to use the stairs since lifts are out of use until 1 July. The UK government is seeking to agree travel corridors or air bridges with European countries with low infection rates so travellers can avoid quarantine requirements. At present, people arriving in the UK, including Britons, returning home must quarantine for 14 days. Greek Tourism Minister Harris Theo Harris says he hopes an announcement in the next few days will allow tourists to travel freely between the UK and Greece from 1 July as the popular holiday destination eases its border restrictions. In an interview, he stated, Greece is a safe country. We've proven that during this crisis and we feel that the risk of someone contracting the disease in Greece is much lower than the rest of Europe and indeed the rest of the world. Senegalese President Macky Sall has quarantined himself as a precaution after coming in contact with someone who tested positive for the novel coronavirus, according to a presidential statement late Wednesday. Although Sall tested negative for the virus, he will be undergoing a quarantine process of 15 days based on medical recommendations. Yeya Diallo, a lawmaker in parliament, announced earlier in the day that she had tested positive for the virus and called on people to take essential personal measures such as maintaining hygiene and social distancing. New York, New Jersey and Connecticut have asked people traveling from states where COVID-19 cases are rising to go into self-quarantine for 14 days. New Jersey's Phil Murphy said people in the three states had been through hell and back and did not want another round of the virus infection. Some southern and western states have been reporting record numbers of cases. The University of Washington predicts 180,000 U.S. deaths by October or 146,000 if 95% of Americans wear masks. A senior seismologist has advised Ghanaians to brace up for more earth traumas this year and even that could lead to earthquakes. Nicholas Opoku, who is with the Geological Survey Authority, said Ghana's capital city, Accra in particular, is an earthquake-prone area and therefore could suffer a natural occurrence anytime. Mr. Opoku gave this hit on TV3's New Day in an interview on Thursday, June 25. This comes in the wake of multiple earthquake traumas recorded in many parts of Accra Wednesday night. Occurring three successive times in the spate of 10 minutes the earth tremors got many out of their rooms and that's all all righty welcome back it's still covered 19 360 we're quickly going to take some comments we have some breaking news for you uh, from the supreme court and it has indicated that the old voters um, id card can be used for the registration um you know ahead of the 2020 elections and so we'll give you more updates on that but anita give us your all right, so this one says, um, hi, good morning. I would like to know if there's any information on how to send stranded people who are residents and citizens in other countries and are crying to go back due to running out of funds and are likely to be kicked out of their homes. We need the government to work on something for us, even though the borders are closed. Okay. Hi, Queen Bella and Anita. It will not be advisable for the public to know how the treatment is done at the isolation centers. I think some people can afford the treatment at home and lift the government from too much expenditure and also from the treatment centers for the vulnerables. And this is coming from Fajinam in Akachi. Okay, this one says, why are there an increase in the index cases of COVID-19 after adherence to the measures outlined, yet the number of cases are on the rise? Does it mean that these new cases of patients were not using face masks and washing their hands and using sanitizers? Don't you think there's serious conspiracy with COVID-19 pandemic? Hmm. Wow. Conspiracy theories already. Hmm. hmm. Anyway, so <laughs> again, it has been um, confirmed. The Supreme Court has indicated that the old voters ID card can be used in the compilation of the new voters register. Remember that the EC initially had wanted to go ahead with a compilation uh, with people only using their passports uh, or getting some two guarantors as well as also, um, you know, using other documents. I'll give you the details. But then now it says that we can use the old voters ID. And so the national ID card and the passport was what was initially um, being projected by the EC to be used for the compilation. And so we'll give you more details um, as they come in. But now let's cross over to Dr. Betha Sewa. Are you good morning? Good morning, Bella. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. How are you as well? Very well. And good morning to Anita as well and to your audience. 
Yes, she says good morning. Now, first of all, we want to find out, you know, the uh, WHO and also some experts had indicated that we should prepare for a second wave. Are we anywhere close to that second wave or with the increase in case counts that is still hovering around the first wave? Yeah, so um, Ghana is still in its first wave. You can only talk about a second wave when you had complete control of the infection. You had a peak and the cases decreased and now you have a spike. Countries like China and South Korea are experiencing a second wave. And you realize that today there's been a quarantine place in states like New York, um, et cetera, where they've had complete you know, reduction in the number of cases. So they don't want a second wave. However, Ghana is still in its first wave. And so it's more of how we can control um, the infection. But yes, there's been a warning that there could be a second wave in those countries where they were able to reduce it. That's why at the beginning of the outbreak, one of the things I recommended, but nobody listened, is that if all the countries could have acted in concert, like everyone goes on a six-week lockdown, mm. no one is traveling, everybody is doing case detection, and people are staying at home, cases are being treated, within two six-week periods, which is three months, this pandemic would be over. But everybody is doing their own thing, even inside Africa and around the world. China did this and thought it was over. Um, U.S. is doing what it can. European closed their borders and, and they've opened them back again. So it's so kind of disorderly that I can see how there'll be little spikes all over. And if everyone came together and just did the same thing at the same time, no one is traveling, no one is doing this, I think that this pandemic would be over in a short time. But with what everyone is doing, um, it's going to be a little difficult. And, and looking at that situation, we're hoping that Ghana does not get to that point. But um, do you think that it's likely to happen? And if that's the case, what can we do to prevent a second wave, looking at how we're managing cases so far? Well, but like, like I was saying, we need to get our cases down. At this point, we're recording more cases per day than we did in the early part of April or even mid-April. So we have to contain, and I think one of the first things they've done is the putting on of, of masks, uh -huh. enforcing the mask rule. But more importantly is the restriction of movement and also ensuring that people are adhering to social distancing. But it looks like the social distancing has become a term that we use versus something that we practice. Because in reality, we're social beings. We like to get close to people you know we spontaneously lend a hand to shake somebody instead of quickly thinking i need to stay um six feet away from this person so it's going to involve some work and i believe enforcing the face mask is one step in the right direction but we've like eased movement and everybody's moving anywhere and if our cases continue to spike we might have to identify some hot spots mm -hmm. and enforce restrictions just like china has done this past week they got their cases completely down beijing got an outbreak involving 106 people and they quickly put a quarantine nobody's coming in they restricted movement i mean that's the kind of strength of willpower that it takes to overcome outbreaks but I think we've already identified some hotspots. Greater Accra region has recorded the highest numbers, um, you know, since the inception of COVID-19. The Ashanti region, um, the central region is also following closely as well. Should we not institute some form of partial lockdown in some of these areas just to bring the numbers down? Yeah, I, I completely agree. And it's going to take some strength of willpower because some people will resist. But resistance is, is when leadership also comes through. Mm. Okay, now the trade minister uh, this morning gave us an update on how we can adhere to uh, the protocols in the workplaces because uh, statistics are indicating that, you know, the various institutions have now become a significant place for the virus to spread. You being an infectious disease specialist, I mean, it's going to be difficult to ask people to stop working, looking at the effect it had on us um, when there was a partial lockdown. Moving forward, what are some of the things that we should put in place um, to ensure that we reduce it to the barest minimum? Um, okay, thank you for that question. I think one, the one that readily comes to mind is enforcing people wearing masks at the workplace and also ensuring that um, work desks are placed a good 
three to six meters apart from each other. If you don't have to interact with somebody, you shouldn't. Um, workplace canteens should be arranged so that people stand apart from each other when they're in a line or something or a queue waiting for their food. And more importantly, identify work that can be done at home. In fact, I've noticed based on personal experience and talking to people that apparently there's so much we can do at home. And those who have worked from home will testify that they actually work more when they're at home than when they're at work. Not only because they're in their home environment, people pile a lot on their plates. So if there's something that you can achieve by letting somebody work at home, that should be done instead of letting people travel and spread the virus as they move around. So I think those are some of the few things that can be done in the work environment. And of course, I heard somebody asking a question about testing. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's like taking a picture versus watching a movie. If you, get, if you give somebody a test today, it does not make them immune forever. They can be negative today and acquire the infection tomorrow, but yeah. at least it gives some kind of a sense of comfort that um, some people are immune or not immune. So when the FDA approves the rapid antibody test, I think it will be in the interest of some employers to get this available so that they even have an idea of who has already been infected in their workplaces. Okay. Now, talking about, you know, putting it under control. Now, let's also talk about vaccines because we're hearing um, that Africa may be encountering its first trial with the vaccines as well. How close are we to getting a vaccine? Because that seems to be the only way so far uh, to get this under control. How close are we? Okay. Very good question, Bella. So I'll just handle it in terms of where the vaccines are. Um, is it really coming to Africa? Should Africa get involved? And what Africa CDC is doing? So first of all, there are human trials that have been started both in the U.S. and in China and in Britain. And um, they are all trials at this point. They produce some neutralizing antibodies, but they are nowhere near completion. It will take another probably 8 to 12 months before a vaccine is ready to be used on humans. Hmm. Now, um, so none of these are ready quite yet. And the other thing is we haven't even proven that those neutralizing antibodies would um, translate into immunity, especially since in this past week, you know, we've always been saying um, because the SARS-CoV-2 virus has 96% homology with the, with the SARS virus, then we can relate the fact that the SARS virus provided immunity from three to five years. Mm. It was just an assumption. But this past week, some people have done studies. You know, this outbreak has only been six months old, so you can only get maybe six months of data. Some people have done studies to show that apparently it looks like the immunity or the antibodies only last for three to five months. Mm. So people are beginning to question that, you know, will even the vaccine work? Um, vaccines will not, it doesn't, the fact that you're making a vaccine does not mean it will work. So it's created some question marks on the vaccine. So are the vaccines coming to Africa? Um, that question has come up. I didn't used to think it should, but here is how um, I've dialogued with a lot of people and it looks like it should. Take it that we are all preparing food, right? You want to eat some of the food. Somebody's bringing tomatoes, another person is bringing onions. You don't want to bring anything, but when the food is ready, you want to come and eat some of it, right? Mm -hmm. That is how the vaccines are. People are working on vaccines, and if Africans don't want to be part of the trials, how then is it that when the vaccine is ready and it works, you want to be given the vaccine, right? Yeah. So, I mean, ethically, we all need to bear equal risk when it comes to trying the vaccine. So that age-old theory of, oh, Africans shouldn't partake in the vaccine, I think is gradually taking a back burner. And a lot of the conspiracy with the vaccines was because right from January, even when there were no vaccine candidates, people started sending conspiracy theories around that there's a vaccine, it's going to be put in your arm, it's related to 5G and currency. There was not even any vaccine. People were just propounding theories. So I think we need to have an open mind. And finally, 
what I like to say is that Africa CDC and the African Union, they are just in the last hour at the end of a two-day conference tackling the topic Africa's role in vaccine development. And here are some of the findings from the conference. Number one, Africa has 1.3 billion people. We consume 25% of vaccines, and yet we don't make any. And the vaccine um, industry is about 70 billion. So in other words, Africa is paying for something that it could make in-house. Mm. Secondly, can we produce the vaccines? No one country can produce the vaccine. So it's going to require a lot of collaboration. And you need a research and development budget of about 7% to be able to partake in vaccines. And so far, only South Africa has a budget of 3% devoted to research and development. So all African countries have to start rethinking how much money they put to what they call R&D that would allow us to produce our own vaccines. We're still far away and the private sector may have to come in and help the government so that we can start making our own vaccines. But so in summary, Vaccines are far away for COVID-19 from being produced. Um, number two, yes, Africa should partake in the vaccine trials because we realize that Africans are not the same as the African-Americans in America when it comes to immunity. Mm. We didn't bet chance of COVID-19 that badly. And finally, Africans, African countries would have to come together and seriously consider um, coming up, making our own vaccines, not just for COVID-19, all vaccines, because we're literally throwing money away yeah. and throwing about 7 million jobs away every time we buy vaccines every year. All right. Interesting. Dr. Bertha, thank you so much <laughs> for speaking to us today. And um, we wish you the very best again. Hopefully tomorrow we'll speak again. And so that's Dr. Bertha Sewa Ai. She is an infectious disease specialist. And um, she was just educating us on the need for Africans to also engage in uh, the vaccine trials and also come up with their own vaccines, not just for COVID-19, but for all other uh, diseases as well. Again, breaking news, the Supreme Court has ruled how it went down at the court earlier. And so this is COVID-19 360. We'll be back with some more. Welcome back. It's still COVID-19 360. We're crossing over to Eric Yao AJ to give us updates on what's happening, uh, especially in the central region, being the fourth hotspot region in the country. Good morning, Eric. Bella. Eric, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Bella. Okay, how are you doing? I'm doing well, yourself? I'm good, thank you very much. I can barely hear you. Are you all by yourself? If yes, that's I am. Okay, but if that's the case, can you please remove your nose mask so we can hear you um, clearly? All right, thank you. So we're talking about the region and how it's racking up its numbers. It's now the fourth highest in the country. Uh, could you explain to us what exactly could be going wrong? Uh, thank you very much, Bella. Um, right now, it's really hard to place a finger on really what is accounting for the increase in our numbers. But if you speak to the health aspect and those who are in charge of the COVID-19 management here in the Western region, essentially, they will tell you that it is because of the fact that we are now getting our uh, results, the test results that were sent some weeks back. So essentially, that is one of the major reasons why we are seeing an increase in our cases here in the western region for instance if you go to Takwa, yeah you, that is the second hotspot in the region and if you come to Sekindi Takwa and Ekma they will tell you that um, uh, they sent their test results and sometimes it takes close to a month before they are able to get their results so the increase in the number like I explained probably is because now we are getting a lot of the test results Bella. okay that, that's that's good then but you also spoke to the late municipal chief executive um, concerning this particular issue what, what did you get from that conversation okay so what what was happening was that the Metropolitan Security Council for Sekindi Takrade that was chaired by the late Anthony K.K. Sam, um, K. 
came out with a task force, the COVID-19 task force, and they had a, a four-week, a four four-month mandate to ensure that we are able to contain our numbers. At that time, we were in the region of um, 1700, that region. So that task force was set up, and they started moving around. Um, you speak to them, they were able to arrest close to 20 people who were mm. violating the stay down protocols. A number of pubs and eateries were also closed down because of um, the fact that they were not adhering to the safety protocols that were instituted by this uh, COVID-19 team. Again, we had a lot of the MPs coming and donating Veronica buckets and a lot of PPs and all that. So, and also if you go to our various main markets, we had some form of uh, decongestion. Mm. Uh, but um, before I came on air, I spoke with the head of the task force, Mr. Obin, and he told me that the mandate of the task force is currently over. So they are not working. So okay. if you come to Sekinita Krade, um, they are not as brisk as they used to when they were tasked to ensure that people comply with the various um, health protocols that were set forth. He tells me that um, because now the mayor is dead, there's nobody heading the MedSec, that is the Metropolitan Security Council for Sekinita Krade. Mm. So they are waiting for the next meeting after which probably they will ask for an extension of their mandate for them to um, carry, go ahead with what they were doing some months back. But by way of, by way of um, explanation and by way of giving you a picture of what currently our situation is, mm -hmm. you know, um, I've been reporting previously that um, the Western Region Directorate of the Ghana Health Service occasionally comes out with an update of our case count. So yeah. as at Wednesday, our case count is 1,276. So we've, report, we've recorded 1,276 positive cases here in the Western region. And mm. if we, you go by the district, Sekindi so Takrade is leading with 479 of the positive cases, followed by Tapa and with 445 cases then a fear for Simington where Connect FM is 145. Then you go to Hunter West, we have 56. Then you go to Pristia Huni Valley, 55. If you go to Shama, that Shama is where we actually recorded our first COVID-19 case some months back mm. from a quarry any day. Okay. And Shama currently has 24. Uh, positive cases. Then, if you go to Wasami the West, we have 23 cases. If you go to Izuma East, 19 cases. And Lembele, we have um, 15 cases. If you go to Wasami the East, we have six. In Poho, um, Jomoro, all have four cases each. Then Wasa East, one case. Then the Wasami the Central, with no case. So currently, that is what we are. Haven't. Okay, um, okay. Been. Well, our time is up, unfortunately. Uh, I'm sure that we can speak to you again another time to find out more about whether there's been some behavioral change. And so thank you so much, Eric Yao Eje, speaking to us actually from the Western region. Pardon me, earlier I said Central region. And so, well, time is up. We have to wrap up, and I hope that you've enjoyed today's edition. Anita, what do you think? Yes, it's been a good show as always, but we're back to wrap the week up tomorrow on COVID-19 360. Stay safe. If you have nowhere going, stay at home. And if you're in school as well, make sure you're wearing your mask and then observing social distancing. My name is Anita Pierre Kufu. And my name is Berla Mundi. Have a good day. Keep watching TV3 and we'll be back same time tomorrow.